Well, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada and started taking acoustic guitar lessons at a very young age. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Good move. Um, basically, I took that off and on for a few years and in my early teens, I believe, I took some three years of classical lessons and a little bit of jazz lessons. And uh, then I started hearing things like Aerosmith Rocks record, uh, Kiss Alive 2, even Elton John's greatest hits. I remember Saturday Night's Alright for Fighting got me into uh, heavy guitars, got me listening for electric guitars, even back then. Uh, an album called Sweet Desolation Boulevard had some really heavy stuff in it. And I, I like the, the combination of, uh, in those, those albums, a combination of melody but it, and vocals and harmonies and, and melodic guitars, but at the same time a really aggressive edge to it. And I guess being 12, 13, 14, didn't really understand, uh, you know, a lot of why I liked it, but uh, looking back, that's why I liked it. It had melody and aggression all in, all in one kind of style of music. Uh, then I kind of got away from the lessons, started listening to what some kids at school were listening to, which was the British wave of metal, some German wave of metal, you know, the Accept Scorpions, and of course the Priest and the Maiden. ACDC is probably one of my favorite bands. Um, Malcolm Young's amazing rhythm playing and Angus's energy and lead blues. Guys like Randy Rhodes and Eddie Van Halen, Matthias Jab, Scorpions, Loudnesses, Akira Takasaki. Uh, those melodic heavy metal guys back in the days of, I guess, mid and early 80s. I listened to everything. One of my philosophies or thoughts at a pretty young age on guitar playing was while a lot of my friends were sitting in the basement or playing, you know, jamming on the weekends with friends, they were playing a lot of uh, lead bass things. Like somebody would play hammer-ons like Van Halen and guys would play the road solos and, you know, get into the, the Momstein and Vi and Satriani and all those, the, the lead stuff. And I'd say about 95% of my friends and musicians I hung out with on guitar were playing that kind of stuff. And I loved it. It was technically, you can't beat those guys I just mentioned. They're amazing players. But the things that attracted me about that kind of lead playing were the guys that could also write great songs and play rhythm guitar. Van Halen was a great example of that. He could, of course, he was groundbreaking on his guitar style, but uh, lead playing, hammer-ons, but everything else he was doing, all the crazy noises and things he came up with. But he was also um, overlooked, not by many, but by some as, as being a, a genius rhythm player and songwriter. And I, I think that's what it's all about. I mean, I, I realized at a young age that I wanted to be able to write songs as well as play lead guitar as well. Um, so I like guys like Malcolm Young for their rhythm playing, and then I like guys like Angus for their energy and their lead playing. Randy Rhodes was a good example, of course, the songwriting he was legendary for, but also his melodic soloing. Anyway, there was also great lead players, Matthias Jabs from Scorpions and all that, but I kind of like the guys that could do both. Shanker, he was a good one. Um, lots of, there's lots of, lots of influences in in my playing, just too many, there's not, not one or two, and that was kind of a good thing for me, it helped me I think survive with my career so far, putting out all these records over the years and still having a, a really good strong fan base, uh, was because their music was diverse, it was not just one style and it, we didn't stick to it forever, we just kept changing, thanks to my many or too many influences. So that by the time I was introduced to Venom, Slayer, Metallica, Exodus, Anthrax, Exciter, Razor, I'd already had the guitar playing and knowledge, metal knowledge, I guess you could say, of the more melodic side of things. But something got me when I heard Kill 'Em All and the first Slayer records, and, and actually Venom was probably the first really heavy band I was turned on to. Um, I didn't listen to them too much. They were like a stepping stone onto the stuff I really enjoyed, which was the Ex Exodus Slayer Metallica records. Um, but a friend of mine, John Bates, uh, was a singer, still is. This must have been somewhere in 84. He and I got together, we party, we just hung out, we tried. Uh, I, I liked hanging out with him because he got all the, the girls at the time and I was one of those 
kids that just stayed in their basement and practiced guitar and didn't have any kind of a life outside the basement, basically. Uh, so I like hanging out with him on weekends because he just, he got all the girls. Jeff Waters called me and said, let's form a band. I heard you can do ACDC. Can you sing like Bon Scott? And I said, of course I can. So I, uh, I went down to his place and we put together a band and we, uh, it was called Black Christmas, the first thing we did. And there was, uh, what was it? There was, there was five of us. Jeff was the lead guitarist, I was the singer. We uh, did some, uh, what, Exciter. We played uh, uh, Judas Priest. Mostly covers. That was all covers, yeah. And after that, we were like, well, that was pretty good. And uh, Jeff had uh, a couple other people around that he was working with, a guy named John Parenbaum. And he was kind of singing like Judas Priest. And uh, Jeff said, well, come up with a song. Like, he goes, use the word annihilation or something like that in the song title. I like that word. And I was like, okay. And I came up with this song called Annihilator. And uh, Jeff really liked it. Jeff liked the, the word. He liked the uh, Anaya something. So I came up with Annihilator. Wrote this this song about a, a beast or some sort of destructive force. And bang, we ended up getting together. And he was the first singer in Annihilator. Uh, we recorded a song called Annihilator a long time ago. Not the one that's off our 94 King of the Kill record, but it was an original version, a completely different version of uh, the song Annihilator. We went in the studio and recorded. I think Jeff played every instrument on it. I think he even played the drums, and I sang it. And, uh, and we played, brought it down to the radio station, and Jeff was like, okay, John, I got this stuff, and it's going to be called the Jeff Waters Project. And I went, Jeff, that... Dave's like, sucks, dude. <laughs> and he's like, no. And I'm like, yeah. So I think, uh, I said, let's call it an island. We'll name it after the song. And Jeff's like, no, I'm going to do the stuff with John Parambam and the stuff with you. It's all going to be called the Jeff Waters Project. And I'll have different singers. And I said, it's not that kind of music, Jeff. Let's do it like this. And he actually he bought into it. It was hard to convince Jeff of anything when he was 18 yeah. years old. John was a good guy. He was also a great lyric writer. He has written co-written or written, what did I say, co-written many, many classic Annihilator songs. Uh, Alice in Hell being one of them, right up until King of the Kill. Uh, I think something off Refresh the Demon he was, or Remains, he was working on a few songs with me then. But he's been responsible for the lyrics for, for some of our most popular songs. We ended up putting Annihilator together back in 84, 85. Uh, got a local drummer in Ottawa. We were all from Ottawa. Got a, a drummer named Paul Malik. Bass player was Dave Scott. Not to be confused with the later guitar player Dave Scott Davis. I guess it was just the four of us. It was one guitar only, myself. We tried a bunch of different rhythm guitar players, but no one was good enough for Jeff. He was just too good. He was. He was so good. Kids would come from all over the neighborhood. So we lived in the same neighborhood, right? That's another bonus to it. The kids would come from all over the neighborhood and they'd try to like, cut heads with Jeff and he would just rip them a new asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the four of us. It was one guitar only, myself. We got together, I think, somewhere in 84 or early 85 and uh, recorded a demo in Paul Malik's mother's fashion clothing store basement. Yeah, the four of us sat down in that basement and we wrote Alice in Hell. We wrote um, most of the songs for the first two albums. And uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. We would go down there. I would try to drag Paul, especially the drummer, down there as many times during the week as I could because I wanted to jam with him and write and write and write songs and riffs, which was real tough on Paul, but he stuck with it and uh, was on both of the Annihilator demos back in 85 and 86. This is our first demo. It was actually originally called Psycho Metal Kills. Later, months later, it was changed to Welcome to Your Death much more appropriately named demo. So Welcome to Your Death had, I don't know what it had here, it had a bunch of songs that ended up being on Alice in Hell, our first record. And this demo was recorded uh, in the basement of Paul's mother's fashion clothing store. It had Crystal Ann, Welcome to Your Death, Lust of Death, which ended up being Human Insecticide, Burns Like a Buzzsaw Blade, Back to the Crypt, which ended up being a uh, EP or bonus song later, um, and I'm in command. A uh, cool song that ended up being on Never Neverland, B-side. So that demo 
was sent out to fanzines around the world. Back then, you didn't have email, so I would spend all my time making cassette tapes on my parents' equipment. I would literally spend weeks making dubs of these cassettes and raising the money to, to send these out to all the different fanzines and different underground radio stations, you know, midnight metal shops on Sunday nights. And I would send out hundreds of these packages, but it got the name Annihilator around and we got a lot of, you know, independent style press out of this thing. And we were shocked when these people would review it in their fanzines and then mail it back to us. So that really got me going, realizing that I, I could actually, me personally, I realized that I could do something, work hard at it, and organize a, a bunch of other guys to be, uh, motivate them enough to get something done with me. And we could put something together and we could get some attention with it, albeit, you know, smaller fanzines and, and it wasn't a record deal or it wasn't a shows or anything, but it gave me the motivation to kick in the ass to, to hey, let's see what else we can do with this. Anyway, we took that, uh, based on the demo and the little reaction we got, we played a few shows in a place called Valdor, Quebec. Valdor, 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 Quebec. That's where it was. So that was where, that was where Annihilator kind of came together. None of us had really been on the road before. We were just kids, and uh, oh, it was just, it was just madness, you know. Someone said, "Okay, you're free. Go ahead, go crazy." Everyone in this, everyone that we played for, it loved us. Yeah. We were the house band, I think, for a week or two. Really cool place, party, party place. Uh, we we just played Annihilator songs that we'd recorded. We must have had about eight by that time, maybe no, probably about ten by that point. And we played some uh, a Razor cover tune, and I think maybe a Slayer cover. I'm not too sure what, but I know we played a Razor song. Um, and that's uh, that's about it. We came back from there. Uh, things weren't working out with a couple of the guys. I pff, cloudy memory, maybe it's selective, but uh, I don't think things were working out too good. I was kind of driven. I realize now that at that point I was really becoming, um, you know, obsessed in a way with Annihilator and wanting this to go and every little good thing that would happen would just fuel me to keep going harder at things. It's kind of hard for other people to keep up because I was basically was the leader and the main songwriter and I was, you know, setting schedules up and I was just, uh, you know, come on guys, you got to work harder. You got to work on your parts. You got to do this. You know, it was, it became a real, really strong Drive. Jeff. Uh, Jeff's a very passionate guy. He, uh, I've seen him pick up a bass player and throw him against a wall for uh, trying to leave. I don't remember what it was, but he did something that Jeff didn't like, and that was you know, there was uh, there was a little testosterone going on. <laughs> but it's cool. Kind of weeded out the people that didn't really weren't into doing this at that time. Although they were all great guys, looking back, they were all great guys, and and they were all talented guys. But I think my drive was just so much stronger to to do something with this music there wasn't much out there in heavy metal we were one of the first ones and um i got we got to take that and and arrange our own songs our own songs were that good because you know we were being pushed to this le level by, by jeff and he did he pushed us and made us the, the best we could be i ended up with paul malik the drummer from the first demo uh and myself doing a demo again called Phantasmagoria. Now we did this in, um, I think it was 1985. There it is. A guy named Rob Lang designed this demo cover for Phantasmagoria. Just before we did this demo, uh, I think I got a phone call. I'm not sure. It might have been a phone call or a, a letter or something from a guy named Monty Connor. And he was working at a Staten Island radio station, WBAB. Uh, the Witching Hour, I think his show was called. And he was uh, independent radio DJ for a metal show. And again, it might have been on Sunday nights. I'm not sure. But uh, he ended up getting hold of me and I got him a copy of our first demo, but I'd also got him a, a bootleg cassette tape of our show in uh, Valdor, Quebec, back in, I think it was 85. And he liked it a lot and he really... He, I think he was a real fan of the band back then and believed that we might have a chance to, to do something with, with, with our music. But uh, Monty ended up working for Roadrunner Records and was 
the guy who signed Annihilator. So that was we were his first signing. So it was very very lucky that uh, we got these tapes around and, and that Monty liked it at the beginning. It really really got us going pretty quickly. Back to the Phantasmagoria demo. It featured about let me see let me read it four songs four songs only. The songs were Gallery, which ended up being sections of that ended up with a song called Never Neverland on our second record. Allison Hell, which was our flagship song. Phantasmagoria, which was on Never Neverland. And Lygia, which ended up being on Alice in Hell, first record. I was on this demo playing guitar, bass, and singing, which it's not really singing on this thing if you've heard the demo, but it's uh, more like a, a death metal style of vocal. I was very unsure or unknowing about whether I could actually sing or not, so I didn't even bother. I just tried going, you know, yelling like in a sort of real death metal style. Rah. So that demo did a lot for us. That became one of the top three most popular demos of 86, 87. I think it was 87. Um, back then, of course, there was a huge cassette underground tape trading thing going on, and, and uh, that demo was right up there with the, I think it was the Megadeth and Metallica demos, uh, which is really cool for me. A kid in, kid in uh, at that time, in his parents' basement in Ottawa, uh, doing a little demo on a four-track in the, the parents' basement, and, and having our demo being reviewed and in all these magazines, even some of the bigger magazines were starting to review the demos. Um, they had demo sections. And to get all these chart positions on, on you know, college and independent radio stations, metal radio stations, it was, that was a real, real boost as well. And I realized the harder I worked, the harder I could get people to work with me. And the more we wrote songs, the more we had a, a chance to actually get a record deal out of this thing, which was the ultimate goal. I, I don't, not sure if I believed it was realistic or possible, but I think that's what my goal was. Anyway, we finished that Phantasmagoria demo, sent it out, I got a great reaction, and through that demo, I ended up meeting a manager from Vancouver. Um, made me a whole bunch of promises. I believed him. Was uh, supposed to have all these great plans set up for me, you know, a place to live, some furniture and a vehicle and all this kind of stuff. And it turned out to be a, a bit of a joke. I ended up in 87, summer of 87, I ended up moving out to Vancouver, which at the time was, uh, turned out to be a bad thing. Stayed in uh, above a strip club in a really raunchy, seedy, dirty, cockroach infested hotel. Um, it was one of the toughest couple of years of my life. But looking back, surviving through those first couple of years out there uh, by myself was what made me strong enough to deal with everything that was coming up. I remember being out there with all the promises that were given to me and find, realizing it was not one of them came true at the time. Uh, I finally got into my own place, ended up on social security, welfare, whatever it was called, and uh, I had nowhere to sleep except on the, the hard wood floor. So uh, I was given I was given a th $35, $45 to go and uh, I, I, to buy a bed. Well, you can't buy a bed for $35 in Canada, I don't believe. So I ended up going to a, a futon, one of those little mattress stores, uh, to buy a futon. It was a used futon, stained, disgusting thing. But I remember when I got that futon, I realized that I was living the metal life, the metal dream. I was paying. I was suffering. I was going to make it. So anyway... That you stained futon was a big deal in my life at the time. <sighs> One good thing happened to me right away. I met Ray Hartman. Went to a rehearsal space he was playing in, a little storage warehouse place in New Westminster, BC. And uh, it was like a little storage bin, they called it. And he set up his drum kit there. I brought my Marshall amp and cabinet, my Vantage Flying V guitar. And we sat there and we jammed to the first two Annihilator demos. We'd made some changes to those songs and some songs I'd written after that. Uh, so we, we basically started jamming most all of the songs for uh, what would be our first release, Alice in Hell. And uh, I'd already had an idea 
through the demos and other things of what I'd wanted on the drums. But Ray was a real, really professional guy, really knew how to play drums, and he was able to add some perfectly tasteful things to what I'd already ended up doing, and also with Paul Malik, the original drummer. We went into a small studio, demo studio, in New Westminster, B.C., and this was where we were supposed to be recording our drum tracks and our first record. Uh, the idea back then was that we were getting some offers from some companies, uh, independent metal labels, but while we were trying to figure out which offer was good, which is kind of a good problem to have back then, uh, we were going to go ahead and start the recording of the record anyway. Uh, Roadrunner was interested. That was, of course, our, our good friend Monty Connor was working there, and he wanted the band. We had another one, I think Mechanics and Metal Blade. I, I can't remember what the labels were, but there was a bunch of other labels that showed some form of interest. Um, but basically, Ray and I went into this Fiasco Studios in New Westminster. We went in with this engineer that we were hooked up with, and his name was Paul Blake. Paul would go on to be one of my best friends, as well as um, the engineer on many Annihilator CDs. He would help me set up my home studio, um, a couple of them over the years. And uh, that Alice in Hell recording took quite a long time to do because we were coming in at nights and part-time whenever, whenever there was time available in the studio. As I was recording the music, the bass guitars and the guitars for the record over a period of many, many months, I would audition a bunch of singers. Some were in, you know, Queensryche clones or Halford clones. Some were much more melodic type singers. And um, I s there was a couple of guys we thought would, would be the right guys, but we just kept passing on them. Something would happen. It's always something, drugs, attitude, booze, or whatever it was. We eventually settled on a guy that our manager said, you got to check this guy out. He's a, like a punk rock type guy. He was in a band called DOA, and he was a bass player. And I, of course, said, well, if he's a bass player, does he sing? And the manager had said, uh, he says he can. <laughs> so I was willing to try anything at that point. And this guy came in with bleached white hair. Just looked like he'd rolled out of the gutter. He had a jean jacket and just ripped up and full of dirt and just ripped up jeans and rotten running shoes. So I looked at this guy and I said, wow, he looks like a front man. He looks like a rock star. So the next thing was to see if he could sing. He uh, came in and he sang one way, one style on every single song that he auditioned on. And I realized I'm not going to be doing ballads with this guy. Um, and I did, I did have a lot of melodic styles in my playing and in my songwriting. And I had a lot of melodies in my head for a lot of these songs that ended up being on Alice in Hell. But I realized that if I was going to get this guy, uh-uh, it was going to be one style. And it was basically a, Randy's voice was a cross between punk, punk attitude meets metal bit of metal mixed in there but he had that 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 uh that fu attitude he lived it he looked it he sounded it he was it this guy was just the per ended up being the perfect front man for this band uh, maybe not vocally for a lot of the songs that i was to write later on in life but uh for that record and for the one he was on next uh, called criteria for black widow randy's voice was uh, original he knew it was Randy Rampage when you heard it um, and of course he was one of the important reasons and figures and representations uh, of Annihilator to the public that really got us going live he was something to watch I would just hang back by my amps and play as tight a guitar as I possibly could um, while he would steal the show it was fantastic to watch him at work uh, and at play. He would dive into the crowd at the weirdest times during the set and come back with nothing. He'd have just his jeans on. People would just take his rings, take his jewelry, chains, everything. He was a perfect guy and it was, uh, it was, it was not what I initially thought, but it turned out to be the best, best decision I'd ever made up to that point. So Randy was in and when I could get the guy actually to come down to the studio to record the record, he rocked. He was, since he, o he only had that one style of singing, he was actually an engineer or producer's dream because he would come in and put him in front of the microphone 
and he'd open his mouth and you'd give him two or three takes and he'd have it down. I mean, I put him through the ringer to make him sound as good as, as we could get him. But what you heard from him was what you got is what you got. Aggressive punk attitude. So that's the singer on Alice in Hell mixed with some melodic thrash speed metal on the music, in the music. So that was three of us. Next was bassist Wayne Darley. Now, he's a cool guy. He was a really great guy. I knew him well up until 1993, and then we lost contact, and uh, unfortunately, been trying to, to get a hold of him for years, but uh, a lot of us have not had any luck yet. We hear he's still alive and kicking, so that's the good, the good news. But Wayne was, uh, Wayne was an amazing bass player, he had a lot of different influences from heavy stuff to lighter stuff. I remember he loved Blackfoot, Dio, uh, Purple, just so many different, you know, bands as well as the heavy and newer stuff. Wayne was not only a talented bass player, but he was a good looking guy. He could sing. Great singer. He was like a, almost like a David Coverdale style of singer. Uh, just, just a nice guy. He had so many things going for him. <laughs> Ended up being the bass player up until 93. Uh, and that was the fourth guy. The fifth member of Annihilator, uh, you know, around the Alice in Hell creation days or that area was, uh, we would audition a lot of guitar players, but it wasn't really our priority because the guitar work was done by me on the record and we weren't planning on touring for a while. So we'd end up, uh, I think the first guy we got was a guy named Casey. And he ended up being in the pictures of our first promo from Roadrunner. I don't know if I, I just happen to have it. Check this out. This was our little Annihilator demo. It only had two songs. It had uh, Crystal Ann, the classical piece, and then the song Alice in Hell. Um, so this guy here, where is he? That guy here, name's Casey. He actually was auditioning for the band we were auditioning a few guitar players and uh, we didn't know who we were going to get or pick so we we just picked him for the photo. That would begin a chain of serious lineup events that would continue to happen. Next guitar player we auditioned was Dave Davis. Dave Scott Davis actually. We also auditioned a guy named Anthony Greenham, another good guitar player, but we didn't at the time we finished the record and we were working on a video. We were about to, to do a video for the song Alice in Hell. We knew we had to pick a guitar player. We're doing a video, so come on, pick the, pick the guitarist. Anthony Greenham ended up being in the video for Alice in Hell, hidden in the back somewhere, because we still at that point didn't know who we were going to get. After the video Alice in Hell was shot, we ended up picking Dave Davis as the permanent guitar player. Ironically, Dave Davis was sitting in the little chairs during the Alice in Hell shoot, so he kind of should have been up there playing, but we didn't know. Anyway, we did that Alice in Hell video and then picked Dave Davis as a guitar player. Kind of backwards. Dave Davis would go on and play guitar in Annihilator for many, many years. Even played bass for a short stint. 89, I think early 89. We signed with Roadrunner Records. We released the Alice in Hell video. We released the album Alice in Hell. Uh, and I remember, I remember Monty Connor at Roadrunner being asked a question by me, which was, how many records would you guys be happy with if for Annihilator's first record? And I remember Monty saying, if you sold 15, 20,000, we'd be very, very happy. Um, and I think, uh, I think we sold that within the first, I don't know, I won't give you a, a quote on that, but we sold a lot more than 15, 20,000 records on Alice in Hell. So that was very interesting. The record took off, we went over right away Rampage and Hartman and Darley, myself and uh, Davis to uh, Europe. We play with a band called Onslaught. We were the support act for Onslaught. Bunch of really nice British guys. And uh, we just toured across Europe for about a month and our album just hit. For us it was, it was quite amazing. But the album just hit. We really didn't know it had hit, but uh, we were getting a lot of attention. We came back from that tour and we were offered uh, the tour with supporting Testament in the United States and Canada. And that was a big deal to me because I was a, a fan of Testament. I really liked the Practice What You Preach record that came out around the same time. But that was, that was fantastic. If you can imagine as a metal fan, uh, Testament and Annihilator on tour, that was, that was a good package. 
We went on that and we were also playing for a while with uh, Rothschild America as a support act. Now it was something else. That was a few months in the States and Canada that was just, the, for me personally the, and the other guys I'm sure, one of the biggest parties we've ever had. One of the biggest parties I'll ever have. And uh, that band actually taught us a lot about touring and a lot of different aspects of it and about partying. Unfortunately, Randy Rampage had to leave the tour early and uh, miss some pretty important shows with Testament. We were angry, and especially myself. I was kind of angry that he'd leave just when things were going well. Uh, and yeah, I was pretty angry at that time, but we were given a chance by Roadrunner at that point. We were told that, you know, if you find another singer, let's get moving, let's capitalize on the, the sales of that first Alice in Hell record and the press and touring and everything we've got from that. And let's get another singer and roll with this. So, of course, me being obsessed with it, I went back, looked for more singers. Um, was having a hard time finding the right guy until the label had said, we got this guy named Coburn Farr. And Coburn was, uh, he'd, he'd done one, I think he'd done one record with a band called Omen uh, a few years before. And uh, Monty at Roadrunner had said, you got to check this guy out. He's, Seems like a nice guy, and he's he's got a pretty good voice. You know, people were tracking me down after I was I was in Omen, and uh, saying, you know, this this guy has a he has an interest in, you know, hearing you and and what you can offer the the band and that sort of thing. And I remember I was driving cross country actually of, of the United States, and I um, really didn't know what I wanted to do. I took a big break from Omen, and by the way, for all you Omen folks, uh, I did not break the band up. <laughs> um, certainly we had our peaks and valleys and fits and starts but every band does and I think Omen uh, needed a little bit more room uh, but anyway back to uh, back to Annihilator so I, I took a break from from Omen and and decided to uh, do other things I was I got back to LA I was jamming around and, and playing with a, with a number of people the the metal market was was uh, reasonably good at that time, and uh, finally was tracked down <clears throat> by John Sutherland from Zomba, and you know John is an old guy from Metal Blade Records and and uh, Enigma, and he said, hey, why don't you why don't you give this a shot? And I listened to the music, and it was the most it was it was the most unusual stuff I had ever heard. So I listened to the Omen stuff he was on, and it, it, to me it didn't really impress me too much as far as vocally goes at least uh but monty pushed me into you know audition him get it get him to sing on some of your songs and i think we just we just rolled with that i was at a point where i just wanted to get get moving on the record because i had a lot of really cool songs for the second record i had some songs left over from the uh alice in hell and the demo era so i had a few side b of never neverland had quite a few older songs maybe about four older songs um and most of side A was new. Bang. Never Never Land. Came out in 1990. Uh, we went with Coburn kind of blindly on my part. I didn't know what to expect. And in a nutshell, it ended up being, I think, our biggest selling record to date. And Coburn did an amazing job on the Never Never Land record. It was the, that was, to me, that was my favorite Annihilator CD, was the second one. Never Never Land. Um, Alice in Hell was special because it was the first one and your first time is usually the time you don't forget but uh, this one will always be my favorite record we got the same guys in the band at this point as Alice in Hell except we just have the new singer uh, again I played all guitars on the record played all the bass on the records I had this idea earlier on that you know I either wanted to have a band sound where the whole band plays and you get more of a live feel or do I want to have this thing absolutely perfectly tight whereas you know just like not robotic tight but just where you've got a left guitar and a right guitar on your song and you want them to be dead on that's my decision was okay I want them to be perfect and the almost the only way to do it is if you get lucky and find a guy that's exactly at the same level of playing as you are um, or for you 
to play both of those guitar parts. So I decided to do that. And since I wrote the songs and wrote the bass parts, I thought, well, I might as well just do them myself. So that's why I ended up pay playing all the, all that, uh, those, most of those parts on most of the Annihilator CDs. So Never, Neverland, we went into a studio in Vancouver, BC, Burnaby, BC, Canada. And uh, I can't remember the name. I think it was Greenhouse or Vancouver Studios. I can't remember the name. One of those two, I think. And uh, Katie Lang had been there. Um, there was a band in there we were sharing the studio with uh, called Queensryche. And they had done, uh, they were working on a record called Empire at the time. They were in the big room, the big studio. And when they weren't in there, or just before they got in, we, we did our drums in that room. When they came in, we moved over to the smaller room in that studio. And I did my guitar tracks and did the vocals there. That was a fun time. That was 1990 when I was, I got to sit in secretly. I was spying. Um, see how I worded that? I got to sit in. It sounds like I was invited and they let me. But I snuck in and uh, hid and watched some of that album being recorded. I was very interested in it. How it was being, how these big records with big producers like Peter Collins and Jim Barton, how these guys worked. So that was kind of an experience. Then I'd run back to the, the smaller part of the studio and work on my record. I remember we had, we were doing the vocals on the record and uh, we were really trying to get Coburn to sing more, hit the notes more, and he wasn't used to singing that well. Immediately, Jeff is, Jeff is like, you know, sing the high stuff in Alice in Hell. And um, uh, maybe, maybe nailed a little bit of that and then went into the verse stuff, but I want it, for the record, no one sings as high as Jeff. It's impossible, in fact. I think his, his voice has been recorded uh, off the sound scale. Yeah, I think I think that uh, it's only something dogs and uh, women with very good intuition can hear. <laughs> he was put through the ringer, so to speak, uh, by myself and the producer Glenn Robinson, just trying to get the best for for him and for the for the record. And he walked out. Basically, I think he just walked out on the session, if I remember correctly. Uh, I don't know if he flew home or not. He may have flown home. It's a hard thing to, to get the best out of someone without them cracking. You have to have, they have to have a really strong personality. Um, and Coburn pulled it off. He ended up coming back, doing it, doing a great job. Fantastic job in Never Never Land. Ray Hartman's drumming was the best on that record that I've ever heard him play. Uh, he did some stuff on a record called Car Carnival Diablos many years later that rivaled that. But I think, as was mine, I think Ray's best work was Never Neverland. And that was it. We ended up flying to Montreal, Quebec, taking a short ride to a city called Morin Heights. And we mixed the record, Never Neverland, at Le Studio, which is, for, for those who don't know anything about Le Studio, that was where like the Bee Gees did Saturday Night Fever. Uh, but for me, it was uh, classic because of uh, Rush. They did a lot of Rush records in that studio. So to, to be in that place, just being there and seeing those Rush records on the wall and knowing that uh, you know Neil Getty and Alex were recording here and in those videos right here, I was more of a fan than actually a, a musician a lot of times. So that was really cool. I had a, just a great time being in that studio. So Never Neverland record was mixed by Glenn Robinson and uh, I learned quickly there that when a guy's hired to mix your record or t to do it, uh, you can't be in there with him. They have a vision of what they want it to sound like and uh, it was not what I wanted it to sound like. So I ended up getting really pissed off at that. But in retrospect, the album did so well and gave us so many opportunities that I, I don't care. <laughs> so from then on though, I didn't use a, a producer no no other outside producers came in. I just I always said, you know, even if the album is not sounding the best it could be, I don't care as long as I get it the way I'd like it. I want to be happy with it. Um, and as long as I'm happy with it, I don't care. I don't really care as long as I like it. After we finished the record, we went on our own headlining tour of Europe. And that was very cool because we got to travel with our own catering and lights and sound company and put on our own show, play as long as we wanted to. Man, we had, we had close to 20 people at a time on the bus. It was, uh, it was crazy. 
double decker 22 bunks uh, people coming and going not having hotels um, you know you just longed for that next shower you know I mean back in those days you didn't really care if you if you, if you got a quick shower or not you know you lived for for the moment so you're always wondering uh, I guess for us, where that next shower was coming from, and, and sometimes even more importantly, where the next beer was coming from. <laughs> we were packing the places back then. We did very well, and that was just a dream come true. I mean, the first record's always your dream come true, I think, as a musician. Um, and then, you know, some people aspire to have gold or platinum records or make millions of dollars. And I think my aspirations were just to drink a lot of beer, uh, experience many beautiful usually blonde women uh, I'd also had dreams of getting my first getting a record deal I got that one too playing some big places was a, I wouldn't say a dream it's something I wanted to do but it wasn't a, a driving force like the other three were but I, I, I pretty well gotten what I wanted um, so playing uh, the next sort of phase or step or whatever in an accomplishment personal accomplishment at that age at that time was um, you know to do your own headline stuff and see the world and that was great you know to have meals made for you in your own tour bus and and uh you know fans coming out just to see your band and to see that many people buy your shirts all that, that whole thing was just fantastic to to be a part of and while you, a lot of times you don't maybe don't appreciate it as much when you're younger and sometimes pretty messed up uh, i think some of us Speaking for myself, but I'm sure a few other people, uh, you look back on it and you realize that uh, you should have, you sure better be grateful about what you had a chance to do and what you did. Anyway, I am very grateful. Played with a lot of good musicians, and the Never Neverland lineup was uh, the same lineup as Alison Hell with a different singer, Coburn Farr. And that was quite a, again, a, looking back, an honor to, to be playing with guys of that caliber and to have that kind of a bunch of band members with you it's a blast anyway so we did a bunch of traveling headline tours on that we went to japan colburn and i went to japan on a press trip i remember that that was a just a blast uh, first time to see the japanese culture that we'd see again a few more times um the people there were great yeah i just don't think that we got the push that we needed in america to um, uh, keep the annihilator thing accelerating properly you know, we had to travel quite a ways to get any appreciation for for Annihilator. Certainly, the hometown stuff uh, was easy to come by, but you know, to get that get that fun loving uh, feeling, you had to travel quite a quite a ways. So, apologies to all the America fans because I tell you, you, you just never saw a better live show uh, than Annihilator. So we did the the Europe and then went to Japan. We did the the Canada states. Neverland tour we took a short break and then we for me I guess one of my I'd say top five things in my lifetime that I'll always remember would be when uh, priest Judas Priest asked us to be their support act with another unknown band at the time uh, called Pantera relatively unknown band at the time that would end up being the last time of course that Halford was with Priest until uh, recently on the reunion tour 2004 so that was an honor we did I don't know how long at least two months or something in Europe with Judas Priest in Pantera Priest I mean what an honor I was a huge Priest fan to be able to hang out and party with some of them and just see the world with them was just a, a dream come true for any kid that's into heavy metal back then it was just that was just like living a dream the dream world at that time you just didn't realize what you were getting a chance to do at all um, we shared a bus with pantera at that time that was uh that was something special to look back on just to have had the opportunity to meet and play with those guys uh, although at the time when we were we were touring with the priest and pantera they were the uh opening slot had a shorter set i guess than we did most nights most people didn't know who they were i think cowboys from hell was out in the states at that point but nobody really knew who they were in europe and i think halford was the one that may have realized that these guys are going to be something, be big. These guys have a, a chance at being big. We didn't see it. We were a bunch of arrogant, drunk, young 
rock star Canadians thinking that we're, we're the, the big band on the bill except for Judas Priest. We weren't really mean about it or anything, but we were. We had that in the back of our minds. We thought we were special. Um, and it was just ironic how that one worked out because after the Priest tour, we went back to Canada and barely keeping the Annihilator band and deal together because of a lot of drug and alcohol and problems related to that. Uh, and yet Pantera ended up finishing that tour up and becoming one of the biggest heavy metal bands in the world pretty quickly after that and uh, deservedly so if you listen to Falker display a power or song five minutes alone anyway that's my little that's my little spiel on uh, Pantera after the Neverland tour we left I think we all hated Coburn Farr at that point we uh, I think we used the excuse that he was an egotistical American rock star and and I guess that we were okay. We we were fine. But I think back then, reality was is Coburn was a really good guy who was, uh, like a few of us, were just getting caught up in what we were doing. Some of us drugs, some of us alcohol, some of us both. My drug of choice was alcohol. Exhaustion and burnout and all those things uh, just all came together with a, a lot of fun times and bad times and drinking the, the mud, the blood, the beer, we'll call it. Um, you know, I didn't think I'd ever see those guys again. You know, when I left um, Gatwick Airport, I think we were at, or Heathrow, I think it was Gatwick, in London, uh, outside of London. Um, and uh, we definitely had, you know, those, those, uh, those struggles. I remember, you know, people walking off the bus, people being thrown off the bus. I mean, literally, having to walk, you know, for, for, uh, you know, a period of time or a certain distance, and uh, I got to tell you, it gave you know, gave me character. I, I tell you, I fall back on that to this day. You know, I think about all the things that we uh, that we went through. I think about all the things that we saw. We were almost finished as a band. We were just a mess. We all went back. Didn't we all blamed it on Coburn? The, the fact that we didn't get along with him. But, uh, Looking back, it was so silly because we were all, all of us, most of us were impossible to get along with with our problems anyway. So, Coburn, you rock. I had caused some waves and, you know, a couple of us weren't, weren't getting along that well. I think it's well publicized at this point that, I don't know, that we uh, all agreed to agree on probably that I was, I was the guy out. <clears throat> and um, I think that... Uh, I think it took a while for me to uh, to realize that you know I had to be more of a, more of a person, let's just say, and more of a uh, more of a friend to uh, say that you know I was pretty over the top, and uh, whether other people were over the top, um, it didn't really matter. You know that wasn't really going to get us anywhere, and. Thinking about Annihilator and what, what Jeff had done uh, in the early years and what we had at that time, it was close to lightning in a bottle. Uh, and no one really knew where it was going to go. I didn't think Annihilator would continue after that point. I got back and I didn't quit drinking or anything. I just kept drinking, kept going to clubs, kept partying, didn't know what was going on. I remember getting back from the priest tour and staying in a hotel. Um, I think I'd lost my girlfriend. Uh that I was living with and all I remember is getting back and being in shock being back to a, a normal world it was quite a uh, it was quite a shock to come back after you're on such a high doing things like that and then coming back into a hotel and you're back home and you have to look for an apartment and sort out what you're gonna do now that you've lost your second singer in two albums and uh, you, literally you've been given two incredible chances um, to do something with your band and your music and each time somehow uh, you lose a singer or disintegrate so to speak I'm sure the label and management were wondering oh great what are we gonna do with this guy and his band now we were absolutely dead set on Coburn coming back to the band so that would have meant three singers three albums but Coburn ended up coming back for a short time we did a few demos for some new songs we got a new guitar player Neil Goldberg who's a guitar player from Boston uh, one of those Berkeley guitar school graduate whiz kids 
where he uh, he knew all the scales, he knew the theory. He was very technically a very good guitar player. We were going to work on this new album, the third record. What do you know? You know, here I am. I'm back and had a new lease on Annihilator Life, and we went after it with a vengeance. You know, uh, Jeff and Ernest sat down with me and wrote songs along with uh, with Neil and uh, with others. I mean, we were it was more music than I heard floating around. Um, since the first point I was in the band, it was great. You know, some of the stuff was really cool and really didn't know where the direction was going. But, you know, more often than not, you don't when you're just trying to put your uh, your music together, you know, and you're trying to figure out what's what. Uh, and then it didn't work. Uh, Coburn went back home and that was it. Coburn was finished with us. Leaving Annihilator uh, was a really hard choice for me. Very hard. Um, I, you know, got a chance to write with Jeff, and to tell you the truth, I just never, I never wrote in Annihilator like I wrote in Omen, um, uh, just simply because, you know, I, I just, I just, you know, I, 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 I was a part of the music, I, I felt the music, I was energized by the music, but um, Jeff was always a better writer to his, his musical uh, talent, his, the, his, his way of writing you know, measures and breaks and um, unique, unique and, and uh, I always, uh, always liked the guidance because once I dug in, you know, things went rather well. I operate well that way anyway, you know. Once I know the, the road map or the lay of the land in terms of, of melody suggestions and things like that, I can usually uh, do rather well. And uh, I think uh, I think even Jeff realized that and knew that uh, you know I tried real hard with anything I had, and he did too. My God, the guy was like uh, off the chart in terms of um, making sure that everything was a certain way. You know, a perfectionist like Howard Hughes. Um, I mean, uh, everything had to be you know just a certain way, I mean, and, and he wouldn't stop until it was done, and, and oftentimes would do it under his own steam and power to make sure it was right. So, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of hats off to Jeff a number of times uh, in terms of going the full measure. I pissed some people off because they didn't get to play their parts or didn't get to express themselves, but, you know, you got to give it to the guy that, uh, he, you know, really tried to make uh, make something special, you know. Looking back on that now, it's even more apparent uh, than it was in, in those days, of course. So, um, anyway, you know, we got through uh, most of Set the World on Fire, and uh, um, I just couldn't see myself doing that anymore. And it was a separation of myself and my country and a number of other things that, you know, just led up to me leaving the band. When things got to be such a mess and the band didn't look like it was going to continue, Coburn left. Uh, it was just a big mess. Um, I had decided that I did have a drinking problem, so I decided to quit drinking and smoking at the same time, which was insane. Now I think back about it. Right idea, wrong wrong way to do it. But I, I, uh, I had no idea what withdrawal was. So absolutely no idea what withdrawal was. So I just decided that, you know what, I got to quit drinking. That's it. I'm going to quit. So I quit. And about two days into it, I, I looked down at my chest and I noticed my heart was coming out of my chest about two inches. It was just like bang, 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 bang. It's like 160 beats a minute or something. And I was doing nothing to aggravate myself. I was just walking around my apartment. And I still had no clue that this was the massive daily quantities of alcohol, quantity of alcohol, going through incredible, my body was going through incredible withdrawal. So I had no idea what was going on, so I called the uh, 911, the, the doctor emergency, and uh, they told me, they said, what, what, are, are you doing drugs, cocaine? And I said, no, I don't do drugs, I don't, don't do drugs. Well, come on, sir, something must be causing this, and, and we talked for a bit, and it didn't, I didn't clue in that uh, drinking 10, 12 beers a night for three years, or two, two to three years, uh, and stopping cold turkey could cause that. I told the lady, well, yeah, I drink pretty regularly. I just quit a couple of days ago. She goes, how many did you drink? And I said, well, maybe six a night, seven a night, maybe eight. Uh, meanwhile, knowing very well that it was more like a dozen. 
sometimes even more. And she said, Sir, uh, with my experience, if you say six or seven or eight, it means double. So she said, Sir, you're suffering from extreme withdrawal from alcohol. We, I suggest you call 911, get yourself in a hospital right away and get some treatment for alcohol addiction because you may have a heart attack. And uh, that scared the living shit out of me. So I went right to the hospital, checked myself in. Uh, not a rehab clinic, but into the hospital. And I was uh, helped down from it with some medication. And uh, I got out of that a mess. It scared the heck out of me. And I quit drinking for a few years after that. Uh, but that time in 92, 93, when I got clean, so to speak, and quit smoking too, uh, it was quite a scary new time for me. Uh, I had to get a lot of things together and, and deal with a lot of things. And uh, one of which was, okay, I want to play in this band. Can I, can I have a, a life in this band after two singers and a good run uh, with this thing? And sure enough, horseshoes up my ass. I ended up finding Aaron Randall, young singer from uh, Vancouver, uh, getting Mike Mangini, who was, uh, went on to play with Vi in Extreme and uh, another Annihilator record after that. Wayne Darley was still with us on bass, and Neil Goldberg, the kid from Boston, came up on guitar. And uh, we did what I feel was a pretty good but quite melodic record. Uh, lost some of our fans that were just in the heavy only Annihilator aggression, aggressive type songs. But we ended up scoring big in, uh, in Asia and Japan and in some parts of Europe, and it became a really, really, really good record for us, um, despite some criticism about it being much more melodic than the previous two records. And they were right, it was. I had a couple of ballads on it. The vocals were much more melodic. Um, there you go. So we recorded that record sometime in 93. We went right back to the same studio we did Alice at Hell in, Fiasco Studios in New Westminster. BC, Canada. And uh, we got Mangini to come up and record the drums, which was awesome watching him work. I, uh, I had Max Norman of Megadeth and Ozzy, Randy Rhodes fame. He was engineering the drum tracks, which was really cool talking to him and uh, watching him work. We ended up with three drummers on the record. I'm not sure why, but we had uh, Mangini was on most of the songs. We also had Ray Hartman come back for couple of songs, Sounds Good to Me, and Hellbent for Leather was a bonus track. I think that was on their Priest cover tune. Uh, and I think Ray was on the third one, Snake in the Grass. Then a guy named Rick Fettick played on the song Phoenix Rising on that record. So we had three drummers technically on that record. Neil Goldberg played guitar solos on the Set the World on Fire record. He played a lot of good solos on there. I played solos as well. And he, this is the first time that somebody else played solos on, on, on one of our records. And he did, uh, Goldberg did an uh, amazing solo on the Hellbent for Leather cover tune. His first half of the guitar solo was him, and it's an amazing solo. Uh, again, I played all the bass. We mixed that record in Little Mountain Studios. That was cool. That was in uh, Vancouver. And Little Mountain was where, you know, everything from, uh, you know, was it Coverdale Page recorded their ACDC, Aerosmith Pump record. Uh, just so many great bands recorded there uh, because they had this Little Mountain Studios ended up having guys like Mike Fraser, Bruce Fairburn, Bob Rock, Randy Staub, uh, Mike Plotnikoff. They had a whole bunch of guys, young and old, there that were um, top of the line producers, engineers, mixers, or they would go on to be. And uh, Little Mountain was the uh, famous studio they had there that was famous for the big Dr. Feelgood or the big drum sound, the big, huge drum sound they, they, they got from uh, a warehouse bay out back of the studio where they put microphones in there and uh, that's how they get the big drum sound. Anyway, that was a, a really cool thing for me to go in there. We mixed that record there and then we mixed the song Phoenix Rising. Got mixed in Brian Adams' home studio. He had a studio in West Vancouver and uh, had an SSL console, a nice little setup in his uh, basement overlooking uh, his backyard. And so that, that was an honor being there. That's for sure. Another a great Canadian artist and a great Canadian songwriter. It's quite an honor to be hanging out in his house mixing a song. Anyway, I didn't really mix it. It was uh, I didn't really mix that. That was Randy Staub mixed that song there. And uh, so Phoenix Rising. There you go. Randy Staub, of course, Nickelback, and working your way back to Metallica and, and a lot of the Bob Rock records. 
he worked on. So what happened? Set the World on Fire. We did a video for that song, or that album, and that song, title track, Set the World on Fire. Uh, that was pretty cool. It, it was hell getting that video done. I remember we had uh, the manager, our manager, still the same manager from the beginning uh, up to this point, had got us out on a barge in the middle of a, a, a river in Vancouver, and in the background were supposed to be oil refineries with flames shooting out the shooting up the stacks or whatever they call it. Turned out to be a big freezing cold, icy rain uh, nightmare. The video production company and people overseeing this whole thing just screwed up and we get out on the barge and we've got about 20% uh, of the lighting we needed to shoot this thing to show up on the camera. And uh, the uh, it was shot at nighttime. So we were completely underlit. <laughs> Record company advanced us all this money to do the video. We come, we we end up with a video where we look at it and go, we can't see anything. We were literally taking any any short clip on, of anyone that had some kind of light on them for a split second, and that was thrown into the video to make the video. But uh, that was a disaster. In, so much, in fact, that the president of Roadrunner, in in much less polite terms told us to fly down within the next few days get our butts down to new york and explain what the hell happened with this video and where all this money went and what why it turned out so horribly anyway somehow uh, roadrunner was convinced to give us another chance and they paid some good money again uh, except had a uh, record company person oversee the whole thing so nobody could screw this one up which is a good thing Therefore, we had a great video. We went down to Los Angeles, uh, one of the airports down there, and into a warehouse near one of the airports, and shot the video in a day and a night. Uh, and it was fantastic. It was a good video. Check it out. Yeah, that was a good lineup. Um, the other ones were great, too. So one thing I'm lucky about with Annihilator is I've had amazing bunch of guys, great musicians in this band, and... Not too many people get to work with this many good heavy metal musicians. This one had, of course, Mangini, Randall, Darley, Goldberg, Waters. We went over and we did a uh, European tour. We got to play at the Dynamo Festival, which is something we'll never forget, I'm sure. I don't know how many, 60,000 people or something. It was uh, That was fantastic. Um, I think Anthrax and Suicidal Tendencies were there. And, and uh, it was just, who was it? King Diamond or was it Merciful Fate? I think so. That was a blast, playing to that many people, and we just toured. It was a blast. I don't know what to say. We toured all over the place. We played Italy. It was a mob scene. I remember that. That was fantastic. We had to throw things out of our bus in order to, for them to let us out. We had to throw them articles of clothing, anything else we could find. Throw it up the roof to them. Awesome fans. Awesome fans. We went back to the States. We changed lineups because it was obvious at that point, I think, that there wasn't going to be a ton of money in what we were doing. So I think at least one guy had to leave because he had better opportunities. Mike Mangini. Mangini. He left. Uh, I think he joined Extreme at the time. Uh, much better gig as far as for his career and for money and for what it would do for him. So he understandably had to leave. Uh, I think Neil Goldberg backed out too. Touring was maybe not exactly what he expected, but uh, financially and, and some other ways. But uh, we're kind of sad to see him go. He was he's a very talented, talented guitar player and songwriter. So he left, uh, and geez, everybody left. Everybody's always leaving anyway. It's not a shock. So at this point, uh, to do the North American tour we were going to do, uh, we had to find a drummer, Randy Black. Uh, this first time Randy Black came came in with us from Edmonton and Vancouver. Fantastic drummer. Had a great reputation as being a, a Neil Peart uh, cover drummer. He could play anything Neil Peart could play. That kind of That's how he was billed. Um, and uh, so we had to check him out because we were definitely into somebody who was very tight playing. Uh, and then Wayne Darley left. Uh, that was pretty sad for me because I really liked Wayne a lot. Uh, we don't... I don't think... Many of us who I keep in contact, ex-members, I don't think much. many of us know what Wayne's doing, but um, we wish him all the best. 
Wayne was a very important part of our band for many years. Great live performer. The last minute after Wayne leaves, we're playing Japan. So we asked our guitar player then, who came back to the band, Dave Davis. I'm back. He was back in the band at this point for the North American Set the World on Fire tour. And we asked him to play bass for Japan because we lost Wayne and we, we, uh, Dave was our second guitar player, but we didn't have time to get another player. So we went to Japan as a four piece, um, just the one guitar, which is a little bit strange for me, uh, but I'd done that on the Judas Priest tour. Played the songs with just one guitar. That was a pretty difficult thing to do at the time. But the Set the Roll on Fire tour in Japan was uh, nuts. That was, that was just an amazing tour. Uh, really, really good playing band at that time. Uh, we ended up with uh, Davis on bass, me on guitar, Aaron Randall vocals, Randy Black drums. We finished that uh, tour, and I think it was back home to, uh, let me see, work on a new record. So then we just began the uh, next cycle. I pretty much had saved my... Uh, Saved my ass, so to speak, as far as being able to pull off two albums, two successful albums with two different singers, then getting through serious alcohol problems and quitting. Not forever, but I quit for a few years. Um, And managing to keep a deal with Roadrunner, put a great band back out on the road, and do a pretty good album. And so three singers three albums now with Roadrunner and something's meant to be here because you don't usually have three singers and three albums and have that many records sold and and that kind of career still going so that was when I realized I had horseshoes up my ass now we're into 1994 Uh, Aaron Randall really had his run in the band I think he'd kind of figured You know, this might not be for me. So he naturally backed out. I didn't fire him or anything. I think he just left. I think we just didn't keep in contact after that. Um, I moved into a new house, bought my first home, and had a recording studio built attached to the house. And I spent six months working on that. And uh, I think by, I think somewhere around April or May of 1994, I started working on the uh, recording of King of the Kill, our fourth record. But before that, before I'd actually made the move to the new home in March, uh, a few months previous to that, maybe about four months previous, I I started hanging out with my friend John Bates. He was originally from Ottawa, but he moved out somewhere in 93, I think, uh, to Vancouver. And he and I had had no contact from, you know, 87 to 93, none at all. And when he did leave the band back in, in 85, it wasn't under greatest conditions. So we didn't, we weren't friends after that initial parting. But when he moved out in uh, 93, we hook up and rekindle our friendship, got back together writing, and he started writing lyrics with me for some songs on the King of the Kill record, a song called King of the Kill, a song called Annihilator. Uh, but more importantly for me is he gave me the use of his basement recording studio his home studio that he had going and I did the demoing for the King of the Kill record there Um, he and my girlfriend at the time had suggested that maybe I should just try singing because they'd heard me singing some demos and I was laughing like you gotta be joking Uh, but they convinced me to give it a try this is why not give it a try so I sang on the demos I think I put out like an eight song demo or maybe I demoed the whole record. I'm not sure. But I sent this out to some labels and I managed to get a bunch of offers. Got a deal with Music for Nations in Europe. Uh, They're a British label that had got, I guess they had the the original Anthrax and Metallica records and they signed Annihilator for three albums and that was fantastic. I did my own deal for Japan, Asia and the next three records I put out uh, records in Asia and Europe I don't think I put any out in North America for a while King of the Kill was a pretty cool record for me because it was the first time I was singing and I was also in my first home and my first studio that I'd owned Uh, I got to know a lot about the 
electronic equipment, the engineering side of things, you know, microphones, preamps, compressors, boards, monitors, power amps, subs, EQing, mixing, mastering, all, all that kind of stuff. I, it was like a crash course for me. Um, fortunately, I had my, my friend and, and longtime engineer, Paul Blake, helped me set the studio up and just taught me basically how to record. I had the always had the ears for recording and doing a lot of those jobs, but I didn't have the technical skills or education. So he brought that to me, uh, which I'm very grateful for, because it served me very well since then. Uh, he engineered the King of the Kill record. This was the advent of digital recording. They had a system called the ADAT system by a company called Lesis, and that had been out for maybe a couple of years. And Paul Blake worked for Lesis and uh, pushed me into that kind of digital recording. So King of the Kill was kind of a cool thing. Once again, I played all the bass, I played all the guitars on it. Uh, I got to use, experiment and use a lot of different types of guitars on this record. It was more of a, a melodic heavy metal record a la British Wave style rather than the San Francisco or the thrash Bay Area or the, the German thrash metal that I was influenced by. King of the Kill was more of a, an 80s melodic uh, metal record, uh, which is cool. I mean, it was, it's kind of neat for me to be able to say, well, I've got different records. They're not all the same. I mean, it worked great for Slayer and ACDC. They've got the same sound, same style, pretty much, since they started. And, and um, those are two of my favorite bands. But Annihilator has always been... Uh, a band that just has different sounds, tries different styles, has too many influences in my writing. For me personally, I've got too many different influences to stay to one style. Otherwise, I would get very bored. Also, when you change lineups or you have changing singers or drummers, that can affect how your albums sound too, especially the singers. Um, so King of the Kill was great. Recording in my own studio, Randy Black played drums, uh, Mr. Drum Machine, Drum Computer Man, uh, which is something you need these days when you're recording modern records is you need somebody with feel but I keep saying the word but you got to have tight playing to sound good especially with Annihilator so Randy Black was the perfect drum machine drummer for this band for the records he was on King of the Kill was mixed in a studio at Paul Dean's house Paul Dean is the good Canadian guitar player from a band called Loverboy. North Americans will probably know their music. Remember, uh, what the heck was it called? Uh, the Kids Are Hot Tonight? And Everybody's Working for the Weekend, which is a killer, killer song. And uh, he's a guitar player for that band. Really nice guy. And he let me come into his home studio above his garage to mix the record. And that was kind of cool because I liked uh, Loverboy when I was young always respect his little heavy edge guitar playing he'd had in the, the commercial songs that those guys played um, and I remember him coming out to see at least one Annihilator show in Vancouver which was really cool um, so it was an honor to be able to be at his place and uh, mix the record King of the Kill for me personally was the funnest tour that I've done that whole King of the Kill touring um, Again, the Judas Priest tour we did was a highlight, and a lot of the other things and tours we've done and shows were amazing. But for me, I think the King of the Kill tour was the most fun I've ever had on a tour. Um, I was sober, I was healthy, I was singing, I was fronting a band for the first time. And for somebody who was a little bit, uh, a little bit insecure, uh, and who gets stage fright before you go on, has to go to the washroom, shake, sweats, whatever. Lovely. Uh, it still gets very nervous about interviews or playing shows or meeting famous people, that kind of stuff. Um, it was kind of a huge personal challenge to get up on stage and have spotlights go on you and everybody's looking at you. No longer can you hide behind Randy Rampage or Coburn Farr or Aaron Randall and let them pretty well be the center of attention most of the time on the, on the live show end of it. Now I was in the spotlight, so it was a lot of work and a very fulfilling feeling when I'd finished the touring for that record. Uh, I started out very shaky as far as vocally. I was I was prepared in the sense that I practiced and practiced for six months and worked in the studio on the record, but for uh, 
for actually having a guitar and playing at the same time, playing the technical guitar parts of some of our songs and singing um, some words that are not in the same time as the guitar parts. It was like, it was quite complicated. It's like playing one instrument with one hand and playing another with the other. Um, that took a lot of practice. And as much as you can practice in rehearsal or, you know, at home or whatever, nothing can compare to when you actually get on the stage and, and uh, you know, your throat gets dry because there's so much smoke in the club or uh, dry ice smoke machines are drying you out and, uh, or you're sick from the climate changes or catch a cold from the flight over. There's just a million things that you don't realize until you actually get over and tour and do these things. So that was a, an enlightening experience for me, but it was a huge challenge for me and I was really worried about if I could pull it off. I ended up basically, basically, I ended up pulling it off. I did a great job uh, compared to what I thought I was going to do. And uh, just shows that if you really put your mind to something and believe in it and work your ass off to do it, you can do it. Japan was amazing again. We did King of the Kill Tour Japan. Wow. Okay. We did a couple of videos we did over there for a ballad we had on the Japanese release. It was called Only Be Lonely. We did a live video for the song called 21. Um, and we did the title track, King of the Kill. Touring lineup for King of the Kill was Randy Black on drums, Dave Scott Davis was on guitar, Jeff Waters was on guitar and vocals, and Cam Dixon was with us for the touring for that uh, Europe and Japan tour in 95. That was the end of that one. Uh, skipping ahead to Refresh the Demon, it was released 96, recorded and mixed at Water Sound Studios, Maple Ridge, BC. Myself and Paul Blake sat down and did most of the work on it, engineering work as well. Randy Black was on drums. Jeff Waters was on vocals, lead and rhythm guitars and bass guitars. Dave Davis, Dave Scott Davis, or nicknamed Dave Gloverson, the glove of love, Davis, he played some solos on four songs. That was a cool record, I like that one. Got a nice song for my newborn son at the time, Alex, uh, did a song called Innocent Eyes for him. Uh, the title track, Refresh the Demon, is one of my favorite live songs. I wish we'd done a video for it, but we didn't. Um, we did a video for the song Sin Kill One, uh, which I think it got banned in most countries, but uh, anyway, you'll see it on this DVD. We just did one tour in Europe for Refresh the Demon. Yep, that's it. And Randy Black was not the drummer on the Refresh the Demon tour of 96. We had a guy from uh, one of Dave Davis's friends on drums. His name was Dave Machander. And another one of Dave's friends on bass, Lou Badoso. Two good guys, good musicians. They toured with us for that one tour on Refresh the Demon in Europe. And that was it. There was no more touring. At that point, I went back in the studio and did a record called Remains. Remains was done in, I think, 97. And I had done the, uh, the record just myself and Paul Blake. Uh, mainly, I did the engineering on the record because at that point, Paul Blake had literally taught me enough where I didn't need to, to work with him much anymore. So I was doing most of the engineering for my records at that point. Um, I also used, just decided to use a drum computer. I was, I was drum machine, drum computer. And I just decided, hey, why not try something different? I did more of a an experimental record on this one. It was a metal record. It just seemed to have had more of that technology sound to it with the drum computer. That sort of added to the, the more modernness of it. But this kind of techno drum computer stuff had been already out for a couple of years with Nine Inch Nails and a few other bands like that. Um, I, I wasn't jumping on a bandwagon or on a fad. I was just doing something that sounded kind of cool in the studio. Um, my only regret to that record would be I wish I'd had Randy Black or Ray Hartman or somebody to do the drums for that record because there was a lot of good songs in the record. I think a lot of people just heard the record the wrong way or a different way. If they'd heard it with a real metal drummer on there, I think it would have changed opinions on the record. Despite that, it sold pretty good, but we didn't do any touring on that record. My uh, personal life hit rock bottom number two. Number two, numero deux. I uh, ended up getting divorced, and that put me out of commission for a good year and a half. There was no touring, nothing. Just uh, spent some time getting my personal life together because I had to do some recovering again from 
booze and from from booze alcohol and also from a divorce which was pretty nasty and took a lot of a lot out of my life and uh, physically and mentally as well there was uh, children involved too at this point so that was devastating every time there's kids involved in a nasty thing like this uh, I'm quite lucky to have kept going after that it was a really devastating time took some time off but I recovered I recovered yes Roadrunner Records like the idea I had of getting Randy Rampage back, Ray Hartman back, Wayne Darley, Dave Davis, and Jeff Waters. Well, we managed to get, this is in 99, early 99. We managed to get everybody back except Wayne Darley. He told us that he had a health condition that doctor said he couldn't tour. So we were stuck looking for a bass player. A friend of ours suggested another Vancouver native, Russ Burquist. Basically the perfect guy. Well, I first heard Annihilator in 1989 while I was uh, playing in club bands in Western Canada. And uh, I heard the music and I thought, wow, this great stuff and uh, really technical, but uh, in fact so technical that I just said, I can't play this stuff. And I didn't even bother listening to it for a number of years. Uh, I thought it was great music, but you know, I didn't really spend a lot of time on it and I was more into other styles of music at that time and, and uh, so on and so forth. So. But I thought it was great, and uh, then a friend of mine uh, at the time had, uh, who had uh, done some work with Annihilator, uh, his uh, attack and so on, had uh, been playing me some music. So I, I kind of got into listening to it a little bit more and uh, you know, enjoyed the music. I thought it was really quite good. And uh, then came an opportunity to get in the band, and uh, basically I just got in. It was not really an addition or anything. Uh, what had happened was um, there's a local uh, sports show in Vancouver that they do a, a Christmas special every year, and it's two shows that they do in two consecutive days to uh, to highlight the plays of the year and so on and so forth. And what they do every year is they have uh, uh, some musical artists come in to sing Christmas carols and so on and so forth. And at that time, I was in a band called Freaks by Nature. And uh, they wanted a heavy metal band to play uh, Christmas carols. So we came up with four versions of some <laughs> Christmas carols done metal style. And, uh, and uh, I, we had this stuff on tape and uh, tape eventually got to Jeff Waters and, and he was kind of interested. And we talked on the phone. He said, well, I guess you're in the band. And he sent me a tape so I could start learning the new stuff for Criteria. And... and uh, and then uh, came time to do some auditions. I think, how did it work? I was in the band for the pictures even before I, I did any playing with the band. I, we didn't even sit down and play. So it was just basically thrown into my lap and I just took and ran with it. We did a record called Criteria for a Black Widow. I tell you, we were all just shocked. Randy Rampage was the same as he was in 1989. Kicking butt as crazy as he was in 89. Nothing had changed for this guy. It was the same thing. You know, you guys are all fat, ugly motherfucker. <laughs> so we had a riot watching this guy work, watching him go crazy on stage. I remember going to the first rehearsal, and it was just kind of a, it was kind of a circus. Actually, I wasn't really sure what was uh, how to take the whole thing because it was uh, Jeff, of course, is quite a character. So was Dave Davis, and and uh, Ray Hartman is kind of a. Kind of a, a laid-back kind of guy, kind of grumpy, but he's got a cynical sense of humor. So, and then of course there was Randy Rampage, and uh, I remember the first uh, the first rehearsal was uh, quite something because I had worked pretty hard on the songs. So we started playing and started playing a couple of songs, and, and uh, old Rampage was getting into it as well. And I'm not sure if he had a few drinks, maybe. I don't know, Randy enjoyed having a few drinks from time to time, and he started doing some dance across the. Uh, across the rehearsal room floor. I guess he didn't realize that there was a cord in okay. it and it happened to wrap around his feet. Randy. Over he went. Took the whole PA system with him and there was a big bang and uh, it was quite a crash. And I remember kind of looking up from that point, kind of looking around thinking, what the hell am I getting myself into here? Of course, we couldn't duplicate the Alice in Hell uh, you know, record and writing exactly because so much time had passed since that record and we'd been apart for so long. Uh, one thing we did capture was the energy that we had back then as far as uh, 
you know, in our live shows that we did from the touring after that, and as well as on the record. Very aggressive thrash speed, technical guitar, rhythm guitar playing on it. Um, and as far as guitar-wise, I think I had some very good soloing on this record. This was uh, one of my favorite ones for solos. A song called Bloodbath and Back to the Palace had some pretty cool guitar work on it, I think. Uh, and of course, we got uh, we have Ray Hartman's brilliant drumming, Randy Rampage's aggressive one-style, attitude-filled vocals on this one. Um, we recorded the guitar tracks and bass tracks for this record in my condo. I was living in a small uh, two-bedroom condo after I moved out of my house in 97. Uh, from 98 to 2000, I lived in a small condominium with my son, Alex, and we had... Uh, I had set up a studio in my bedroom, of all places. Fortunately, I knew enough about recording equipment that I could record some good guitar tracks, vocal tracks, bass tracks, solos, in a bedroom. Um, kind of impossible to do unless you really know what you're doing with the, the uh, equipment and the, the technical end of things. But I was lucky enough to have Paul Blake and some other good studio people uh, as teachers, so I learned how to do it. I recorded these bass tracks, guitar tracks, solo tracks in the bedroom. Um, and Randy Rampage did his vocals in my walk-in closet. So if you can believe that, um, Rampage probably sang for a total of 10 hours, maybe 10 hours on this whole record. It was very raw for him, very live, very real. And that was what was cool about that record. The, the playing was fast and technical and cool. Lots of soloing that some of the fans had missed for a few years from me, and uh, and we had Rampage. So that was a really cool experience. We mixed the record in a studio in North Vancouver, and uh, what else? That's about it. We rehearsed over there in North Vancouver as well. We brought some uh, some of our friends from the German press came over to do some uh, in studio reporting, and we were all getting very excited about putting a tour together. We ended up going over to Europe, uh, played a couple of shows in Europe as warm-up shows, came back and uh, then the real touring started, briefly, but it started. We went, uh, I think the year 2000, we went, did a European tour with Overkill. Uh, obviously most of the fans that buy this Annihilator DVD know who Overkill is been around one of the few metal bands that's been around since the 80s right through to now like Annihilator uh, great band great live band and uh, we went and co-headlined Europe with them had a blast and we were also to meet our next vocalist uh, on that tour also on that tour we played in uh, um, Vilnius Lithuania when the uh, the venue actually caught on fire during the co-headline band set Overkill was playing and they got five songs into the set or something the building caught on fire so of course there was a big panic and and then we flew into uh, Moscow and did the gig and and uh, our hotel was right outside Red Square it was actually quite an amazing experience so, uh, it was a lot of fun there was a lot of guys everybody had a good time and the crowds were pretty decent and uh, yeah generally it was just a that was a good time good tour Roadrunner Records also put out two CDs um, during the 90s that were not official studio CDs, but they were, uh, one was called Live and In Command, and it featured, I think half the tracks were with Randy Rampage, uh, live tracks taken from recordings at the Ritz in New York City, and that was back in 1989 while we were supporting Testament. So a bunch of those tracks are on there, really live and raw and real. The other half were with Coburn Farr on the Never Neverland Headline US Tour, and that was in San Antonio, Texas. That was uh, live in 1990. That was fantastic. That was a good time we had then. Um, so pick up that CD if you don't have that. That's a good one. The other one Roadrunner released was uh, Bag of Tricks, and that was a compilation record CD, and it just featured a bunch of old, rare Annihilator uh, outtakes and mainly I think demo songs and songs that never made it on the records EP songs that never made it on an EP uh, and featured uh, this 
one that stands to mind, a song called Fantastic Things, which is a very melodic song, but uh, Wayne Darley, our old bass player, sang that song and played bass on that, which was pretty cool. Uh, there's a lot of good rare stuff on there for the real true Annihilator fan. Although this DVD covers basically the beginnings of Annihilator up until 1999-2000 era, uh, which is Rampage to demos to Rampage all the way to Rampage. There's been some other other CDs. After Criteria, uh, we ended up putting out Carnival Diablos. I believe in 2001, we put out Waking the Fury, 2002. Uh, there was also a Double Live Annihilation CD that came out. That one came out on AFM Records. And then in 2004, we released uh, our 10th studio CD called All For You. That was also on AFM Records. And uh, there you go. Right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm working on CD 11 right now. Just getting better. Just want to say thank you very much for everybody picking up this DVD, watching it, hopefully enjoying it. I, I wish you all the best. We wish you all the best and hope to see you on tour sometime. And there we go. Hopefully we got another 10, 15 years in hell coming up soon. So take care. See you on the road. Enjoy. Uh, what are you up to these days? These days? Where are you right now? These, I'm on tour in Canada. We tour Europe a lot. My band is called Big John Bates. We play with a uh, burlesque troupe of our own called the Voodoo Dolls. So the show is Big John Bates and the Voodoo Dolls. We do, we do a rock and roll circuit. We do a bit of rockabilly, a bit of psychobilly, a bit of a lot of stuff that I got into when I left Annihilator. I got into um, some more underground stuff like the Cramps and the Demented Argo. <laughs> and uh, the band that, that I'm in now, Big John Bates is just an extension of that. You got a CD? Or I do have a CD. Would you like oh, to see it? Yeah, I just happen to have can, one. Can, 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 can you want to get in on that? that? Yeah. yeah, I think they. Oh, there, there you are. Oh, uh, very pretty, very pretty, very pretty. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else you want the people? I, to I don't. Know? I don't. I can't think of anything. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I've obviously buried in my subconscious that the yes. psychologist will have to bring out later. Yes. Nothing I can do about that. Part two, maybe. In the Part DVD. two. Yeah. The, the next DVD. Yeah, I'll try to chop some more. Um, all right. Well, love you, Jeff. Okay. You know, I haven't done a whole lot with music. I miss it. Um, it's not something that um, I need in my life every day, but I certainly like to listen to music, speaking in terms of performing. But um, I sure loved my, uh, my days in the light, and to tell you the truth, I get emails all the time. I, uh, you know, the world is so connected now. I get emails, I get, you know, letters, I get all kinds of crazy stuff as a result of those communications, you know, and it's wonderful what, what Annihilator has done and Omens even perpetuated itself and it's it's really cool stuff you know the music the music lives on the music's great it's still viable and um, it says a lot about the people that that stuck it out and made it happen you know and Jeff's still making great music today you know Carnival uh, uh, Diablos uh, is uh, is hot <laughs> I mean that's that's uh, that's that's pretty hot stuff well, it's been great. I gotta go and uh, left out all the good stuff about uh, you know fist fights in the rain with Pantera and and uh, you know things like that. But uh, you know that's because we were all on the edge and we just <laughs> we're miserable where we were. Happy to be you know in the music industry, but miserable where we were at that point. But uh, learned a lot about ourselves and a lot about myself, and I'm glad to call Jeff a friend today. Because uh, a number of years ago, I you know didn't really think that that was possible, but he's a great guy and and um, all the best, right? And uh, rock on. <laughs> what happened to Alice, right? Bye. Annihilator was a situation that, would, um, for me personally, it just wasn't working anymore. 
and I wanted to move on to some different things. Uh, Jeff gave me a great opportunity to be in his band, and I learned a lot. It helped my playing a lot. I learned a lot from playing with uh, really decent players in that band. Every player that was in that band was always top notch, and good musicians, and generally good guys. So um, I learned a lot from the experience. And uh, in fact, I guess I could say that it changed my life because I went from doing nothing to actually in a position where I really want to continue with music. And so what I'm doing now is uh, writing my own music and uh, doing some session work and uh, just trying to expand my horizons as a bass player and, uh, and learning how to write songs um, uh, with, uh, and also using my website russberkwist.com as a tool to uh, let people know what I'm doing or uh, contact me if they need me to do session work or they're interested in me doing something for them in that capacity. And uh, yeah, just continuing on with music and, and uh, enjoying it as much as possible because for me that's what it's all about. I've never made any money really playing music, so I've always just went about it as it's a fun thing to do and it's a good release for me and I will always continue to play music in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, I don't really have any other Annihilator stories other than some of the Randy Rampage stuff because he was unbelievable. I had never toured with anybody that was that entertaining and I don't think he even meant to be, you know. I think he just was like that. And uh, Jeff, of course, was always uh, hamming it up funny guy, you know, um, could always make you laugh. Same with all the other guys in the band, everybody from Dave Davis to Ray Hartman to uh, Randy Black, Joe Camo, Curran Murphy, Dave Patton. Uh, there was always a, a lot of different people involved in, and crew guys that came in and came out and different bands that you meet along the way. And uh, so uh, that was my time in Annihilator. It was a good five years and I uh, got a lot out of it. And, Jeff and I remain uh, friends to this day, so and possibly we'll work together in the future on something, or maybe I'll hire him to mix some of my music, which I hope to be releasing uh, a five-song demo or something like that in the next little while. And uh, yeah, that's it. So cheers from me, Russ Berkwist. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you all again sometime. Small high hi hat seems really dead a little bit compared to the other one as far as brightness. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to be though, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can. A little better? Yep. I gotta see that. Hi Annihilator fans, this is Mike Mangini. I was a studio drummer on the 1993 release Set the World on Fire. I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm doing and a few stories from the 1993 mini tour that I did of Europe, including a couple of shows up in Canada. First of all, that's how you spell my name. If you don't want to listen to me right now, you can go to my website and keep updated. This is one of the books that I wrote based on the learning system that I developed, which is based on how the brain stores and sends information, but that's not to be explained right now. If you want to find out about it, there it is. At any point, I wrote the book. That's how to find me. In the meantime, I've been very active <clears throat> as a touring musician, although currently I have a foundation here in Boston where I am a professor, associate professor actually, at Berkeley College. That means I put about two and a half days a week in over there. The rest of the time I spend traveling around the world giving drum clinics, which means I tour alone. 
I can do a nice long drum solo and explain my uh, my learning system and even play to songs whose CDs I'm on. For example, Annihilate Us at the World on Fire. I've done six records of Steve Vai in the meantime, a couple of tours with him. <clears throat> a record with Extreme called Waiting for the Punchline. That was in 1994. We toured in 95. And in addition to doing these drum clinics and all the teaching sessions, I fill in my other time with a lot of different artists. You know, I, I do maybe one song or two songs for some R&B guy or punk record here in Boston and also do full-length records. I have, let's see, I'm currently on two records with the singer from Dream Theater, James Labrie. The name of that band is called Mall Muzzler. I'm currently doing gigs with two ex-extreme members, Gary and Pat, that's vocals and bass. Our band is called Tribe of Judah. That's TOJonline.com. Anyway, um, that's I'm just filling up my time with all kinds of stuff. Recently, I've set the world speed record with bare hands at single strokes in a minute. Um, I'm actually into doing all of those and have, have unofficially um, kept up with the pack on the foot records and all that stuff too. Although it's not a musical thing, it's a sports thing. And, you know, fans of Annihilator. I guess I appreciate the fast stuff. I, mean, I have fun doing it, so I mean, why not, right? But um, um, they will be submitting that to Guinness, and you know, it's a nice little thing for the wall, I suppose, but might be an interesting tidbit for you to know. You know what I mean? Because those grueling shows with Annihilator forced me to uh, have to have some stamina. So, uh, and accuracy, too. So I've gone on to, to do that, and that's maybe a, a neat thing that I might not have been as much into had it not been for the stage experience with Jeff and the boys. Speaking of that, my time in Annihilator was uh, a great time. It was the first tour that I did. So for me, um, that tour holds a special memory. And out of all the memories that I have, you know, a person can't remember everything from every tour and everybody. But I do remember special moments. And one of the most special moments was hitting the stage in London. Uh, my, I just I can't describe to you what it felt like to be in a, a basement practicing then all of a sudden all of a sudden you're on stage uh, waiting to play and hearing that, that that scream that only can happen with, with hard rock heavy metal uh, well maybe not really with just heavy metal but anyway there's a certain type of scream and I guess you guys know what that is anyway we appreciate it and I'll never forget being in London waiting to go on stage <clears throat> I heard the crowd and I didn't know it was the crowd. I thought it was this white noise sound they were doing in the club because we were in a dressing room that had thick cement blocks as walls. You can't, re you can't even hear through that. That's how loud the crowd was. I walked out on stage and just was overwhelmed. I just couldn't believe the noise. I never had so much fun in my life, truly. Also from that tour, a special moment was the Dynamo Festival where there were 73,000 people not itching their ears like I just did. What a, what a feeling to look out. I mean, I had more fun watching people and probably than they did watching me. I didn't know who I was anyway. What's the difference, right? But that was a, that was a great time as well. So that tour holds some special moments, being the first extended one that, that I had done. Uh, playing with the guys in the band was special. I had been friends with Neil Goldberg, who's the one that got me into the band, really. Uh, he introduced me to Jeff who ultimately made that decision anyway, because we got along well enough that we decided, why not, let's do this. And he was kind enough to ask me. But um, I had known Neil for a while and been in a band with him called Rick Berlin here in Boston. Neil went off uh, after getting in contact with Jeff, and um, you know he's the one that connected me into Annihilator. Subsequently, I did projects with Coburn and Jeff, uh, excuse, excuse me, Coburn and Neil. And um, I've, I've been able to maintain my friendship with, with Neil, mostly because we've been, you know, we see each other and uh, we we're friends, so I yeah, guess that makes sense. Um, and um, let's see, that was a fun project. Uh, what, can I, what else can I tell you? Oh, running into Jeff again at one of my drum clinics in Vancouver is why I'm here. We made contact again through some mutual friends and we met up at that drum clinic. I had a ball. I, I uh, played a track off of 
set the world on fire at the clinic and uh, no zone actually and that was just great uh, knowing that Jeff was in the crowd so it was a special moment that's the basic contact I've had with Annihilator since then and um, obviously we'll be keeping in touch more henceforth Nineteen ninety one. That was when I was in the band. I'm Neil Goldberg. I joined Annihilator right after getting out of Berkeley College of Music in Boston. I'm this guy right here. Tall one. And uh, went up to Vancouver to hang out with the guys. Actually to back up. It took a while to get into the band. They were on tour with Judas Priest. Um, I guess their other guitar player had left mid-tour with some crazy story and a friend of mine, uh, Tony Nichols, who was in a band called Malaya Rage on uh, Epic at the time. He was a friend of mine in Boston and he told me about Annihilator and I should check him out and you know I was into the whole obviously guitar thing and thought Jeff was a serious guitar player and it would be cool to try to get in the band so I made a demo actually made like two or three probably three or four tunes like really heavy kind of progressive tunes that I wrote specifically for Annihilator to try to get in the band and uh, had Tony's management send it up to uh, Vancouver and they checked it out they liked it a lot and then it took a while for Jeff to get off tour uh, with Judas Priest this was probably the beginning of like uh, 1991 and uh, they checked it out I talked to him a couple of times he thought it was pretty cool wanted some more stuff so I sent more stuff finally they uh, sent me a plane ticket in May um, like I said I just graduated from school so I went up there uh, definitely an interesting experience to fly from Boston to uh, Vancouver, you know, British Columbia, and to meet some dudes in a serious metal band. So, uh, you know, I did that. And then it was time to record the record, and long story short, Ray Hartman was like, I've had enough of this, I don't, I don't want to do it. So he, uh, he left, and a friend of mine, Mike Mangini, uh, stepped up. He's the guy, obviously, that played drums on the record. He played in Extreme, he played with Steve Vai. He and I uh, had played together for like three years in Boston and were pretty friendly, so um, you know, I told Jeff he was great. He came up, we started recording uh, the drums for the album with uh, Max Norman, who uh, had done some recordings of Randy Rhodes and Ozzy and Megadeth, so we were pretty psyched to work with him. Uh, we were in a little studio up in Vancouver and uh, we just started recording all that stuff. Uh, spent all this time rehearsing all the material we were going to do for the set, The World on Fire Tour in Europe. And uh, we rehearsed for two or three weeks, did a couple shows in uh, Vancouver. You know, that was cool. Definitely a uh, new experience. I had been in other bands in Boston, but I was never in a band that had a record deal, so it was cool to have, uh, you know, the fans know the music, at least on the older stuff. And, uh, you know, we went to Europe and played a bunch of shows over the course of a month, toured in a bus, did the whole thing. For me, that was pretty cool. You know, it was the summertime, uh, played in Germany and Amsterdam, Italy all over the place. Uh, Holland did a big festival, Eindhoven uh, festival, you know, two days, all these bands. It's pretty cool. So after that, I moved to Connecticut. Uh, for all you people that don't live in the U.S., Connecticut's a couple hours drive uh, south of Boston. And I, you know, started working at this huge studio, big recording studio. I was writing music, I was recording and engineering records. I was producing music, I was playing guitar on stuff, you know, for like ESPN, sports music, and all that kind of stuff. I uh, worked with Blondie. Um, I also worked with Vertical Horizon in the studio. Um, had a chance to write music for uh, three Discovery Channel shows that were on internationally. That was pretty cool. Also wrote music to uh, a kid's cartoon called Vampires, uh, which was fun too. That was like 13 episodes. And it was on in the United States, it was on uh, in a lot of different parts of the world, actually. Uh, that was probably like seven years ago, that was pretty cool. Did some other things at the studio as well. Uh, wrote music for an independent film, a bunch of commercials, blah, blah, blah. That went on for about four years. And then I moved to New York City, which is where I am now, in the studio. I've been here for about four years, doing similar things, writing music for uh, television commercials in the U.S. as well as uh, internationally. Stuff like General Electric, uh, 
Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, that kind of stuff. Uh, Gillette razors, I do all that stuff, writing the music and the sound effects, playing guitar, and uh, also have a band too, which you might be wondering about, called Red List, right there. It's uh, redlistband.com if you want to check it out. And uh, it's pretty heavy music. It's got a lot of different influences, you know, heavy riffs, some, uh, you know, heavy grooves, and some rap, and uh, it's pretty cool. You should check it out. Uh, and that's pretty much it. You know, I still keep in touch with uh, Coburn and obviously Jeff uh, and Mike Mangini. I just saw Mike play about five nights ago in New York City, and uh, all is well. So, that's it, man.